Welcome to Electron Online. Now we're ready to calculate the current state. Remember, we calculated the predicted state, then we calculated the Kalman gain, we calculated the covariance matrix, then we brought in the what we would call the observations, the observation of position or the measured position and velocity. Now we're ready to put it all together and calculate the new current state. So that will be a combination with between the predicted state the measured values, the covariance matrix, and then the Kalman gain to determine how much of the new measured values we should consider in updating the current state. Here's the equation. We take the predicted state and add to that the Kalman gain, which is a fraction. Basically, think of the Kalman gain as a fraction between 0 and 1. And we multiply that times the difference between the measured values and the predicted values. If the Kalman gain is large, that means we have a very small assumed error in the measurement, then we want to take the entire difference between the measured value and the predicted value and add that to the predicted value. In other words, we put a lot more weight or importance in the measured values. If the Kalman gain is very small, then we put very little value in the new measured values and we only want to adjust the predicted value by just a little bit to try to get a more accurate position and velocity of our airplane. Well, let's go ahead and plug in the numbers and see what that looks like. Here it looks like the number is, is less than one half, which means we put less value in the measured value and a little bit more value in the predicted state, the, the values in the predicted state. Since we couldn't remember what they were, I wrote them down. So the predicted state matrix is over here. We had a predicted position of 4,281 meters and a predicted velocity of 282 meters per second. We add to that the Kelman gain, which is equal to 0 0.405, 0, 0, and 0 0.410, multiplied times the observed values. Uh, maybe I'll go ahead and put a parenthesis here, because we're going to multiply the times the difference between these two. The observed value was 4260 for the position and 282 for the velocity, subtract from that. Now the H matrix in this case, let's see here. We want to multiply this times, let's see in a moment what that needs to be. We'll figure it out. And here we have the predicted state. The predicted state is 4281 and 282. I'm kind of running out of room here, so I'm trying to do it like that. Hopefully you can see the difference there. Now, what does this need to be? Well, I want to end up with a one by one matrix. Or I should say two by one matrix because I have a two by one matrix here. I need to subtract the two by one matrix here. And let's see, two by one. So I need a two by two here. Otherwise I can do the multiplication. So I need a one, a one, a zero, and a zero. So the H matrix here simply becomes the identity matrix again. When I multiply this matrix by this matrix, notice this is a two by two, this is a two by one, the two and the two says I can do the multiplication, and I end up with a two by one matrix, is what I want to end up with. So that looks good. Again, these are simply transformation matrices that allow you to change one form of the matrix to another. In this case, we didn't even need to do it. We can just simply get rid of that. But again, that is what the identity matrix is, isn't it? When you multiply times an identity matrix, it's like multiplying times one. So it can be there, it cannot be there. It would not make any difference in this case. Sometimes you do need a specific form of the matrix there to make the transformation from this matrix onto what you need it to be. All right, this now becomes 4281, 282, plus 0 0.405, 0, 0, 0, 0 0.410. And now we simply need to subtract this matrix, or this matrix from this matrix. So 4260 minus 4281, that becomes minus 21, and 282 minus 282, which is 0. Notice, since the predicted state match, match the measured value, there's not, there doesn't need to be any change or any adjustment with the Kalman gain. But since the measured value was different from the, the predicted value on the position, we will have to make some adjustment using the Kalman gain. And depending upon how big the Kalman gain is, we'll take a certain percentage or a certain fraction of that difference between the measured value and the predicted value. 
So this becomes equal to 4281, 282 plus, when you multiply this times this, you get this number times this number plus zero, and then you get zero over here. So this becomes zero, but the point 0.405 times 21. That's a negative, which is a negative 8.5. So minus 8.5, and when we adjust that, we get the new, what we call current state, 482, uh, 4281 minus 8.5, that's 4272.5 and 282. X sub K. And that's a very important result right here. What does this mean? Let's take a look at it. Now, notice that based upon the equations that we have, based upon the predicted state we came up with, we estimated that the airplane would be at a position of 4281 meters and with a velocity of 282. However, the measured values were that it was measured to be at 4260 and the velocity was 282. Since the velocity of the measured value matched the velocity of the prediction, we did not need to make any adjustments. So the Kalman gain did not make any changes there. But since the predicted value of the position was 4281 and the measured value of the position was 4260, we didn't want to believe this completely. The Kalman gain tells us right here, tells us how much fate we have in the, in the measured value and how much fate we have in the predicted value. And it turns out that the predicted value was believed a little bit more than the measured value, so we want to lean a little bit more towards the predicted value rather than towards the measured value. Notice that if you take a look at the results, if the predicted value is 4281, and the measure value is 4260, the Kalman gain gave us a value in between, but a little bit closer to the predicted value than to the measure value, because according to the Kalman gain, we thought that there was too much of an uncertainty in the measure value, so we didn't put as much credence into that value, so we only adjusted the predicted value by a little bit, because we wanted to lean more towards the prediction rather than towards the measured value. However, just because we lean more to the predicted value than the measured value didn't mean we completely ignore the measured value. We use the measured value to try to come up with the best adjusted predicted position of the airplane. And this would be better than to use either this value or that value. And that's what the Kalman filter does. It zeroes in very quickly to where we think, or not where we think, but where the Kalman filter calculates where the position most likely is going to be. And that's what we do with the Kalman filter. So now we have the updated position, X sub K. Now, of course, we need to start getting ready for the next iteration. And so then you'll see what we do in step seven to adjust for the new process covariance matrix, and then I'll update the new initial conditions for the next iteration coming around. So take a look at our next video. You see how we then get ready for the next process, the next iteration of the Kalman filter and then the whole process starts over again and we'll show you what it looks like on the next go around as well and that's how it's done.